Professor Morrissey, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. It's an honor to have you with us. We're going to ask you to give a few opening comments on Woodrow Wilson and the Constitution, and then we'll go to questions. Great. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, what I want to start out with is actually a quote from the very young Woodrow Wilson when he was in his 20s. He was uh, writing to his fiance, a woman named Ellen Axon. And the, the, the sentence begins, my heart's desire is. Now, typically a young lady whose fiance starts a sentence out with my heart's desire is, might very well be thinking that the rest of the sentence is going to be about herself. Not so with young Mr. Wilson, however. And I'll read it. My heart's desire is that I may become one of the guides of public policy by becoming one of the guides of public thought to perfect our forms of government and our means of administration. So that was a very romantic thing that he, uh, he proposed to his fiance on that occasion. Um, and there are two or three elements that he is particularly interested in there public thought, guide of public thought, perfecting the forms of government and the means of administration. Uh, Wilson's uh, contributions or his, uh, the, the thing that makes him unique among American presidents is that he intended, he was the first to really uh, uh, change the American regime in a fundamental way by transforming the notion of what public opinion is, what popular sovereignty is. And he did it in a couple of ways. First of all, he, um, he, 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 he formulated the notion of an administrative state, uh, a substantial professional bureaucracy. Another thing he did was to talk about leadership. And the other thing he did was to talk about the what he called the elastic constitution. Typically we say the living constitution nowadays, but his his term was the elastic constitution. All of these three things, these elements are related. A year after that letter to his fiance, he wrote the essay that made his reputation as an American political scientist. In 1886, he called it the study of uh, uh, the study of administration. And at that time, the people who are interested in public administration tend to be the civil service reformers. The young Theodore Roosevelt was a civil service reformer. Wilson didn't particularly care for them because he thought they were just too moralistic. They weren't addressing the institutional problem of reform. And what he wanted to see, uh, it, what, what he was saying was in, in, modern, in modern America, the nation has become too big and too complex with industrial capitalism flourishing, these big corporations, uh, financial institutions, the big banks, national banks for the first time, and, and the sheer population of the country was too big and too complex for a, an ex any one executive to really deal with anymore. He needed, the president needed substantial institutional support and that meant a professional bureaucracy for the first time, a professional administrative state. That was what the study of administration was intended to, to foster. Now, there was a problem here because the models for the administration state were European models, specifically Prussia. Well, the American regime is, was not the Prussian regime. It was not a monarchy. There was no Kaiser Wilhelm in America to ride herd over the, the bureaucrats and make sure they did what he wanted them to do. And he recognized that an administrative state, the administrators might have a will of their own. They might develop uh, 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 policies that were independent of the elected representative. And that's where leadership comes in. Leadership is not the same thing as statesmanship. Statesmanship in the American sense is uh, governing the country within the boundaries of the Constitution as written in 1787 and as, as amended in the subsequent decades. The leadership is, uh, it's not, you know, statesmanship is under the rule of law, but under, le under the leadership, under the elastic Constitution, what you get is um, a, a leader, especially a president, who is who, who claims to embody and interpret and speak for public opinion. 
Now, what does that do? This is a constitutional innovation. What this does is, if you if you recall the, the way the Constitution was originally ratified and then amended, it has to be ratified by the people of the United States. Why? Because it's a, it's a democratic republic. The people are the sovereigns. To change the fundamental law of the country means that you need to have recourse from, to the people uh, ruling under the laws of nature or nature's God, but still popular sovereignty. What he does with this, uh, this, this, this new reshaping or leadership of public opinion is to claim, in effect, that he is now tapping into public opinion. He's now tapping into popular sovereignty unilaterally as the president of the United States, as the direct voice of the people. Um, uh, and and th this, in other words, he can now interpret the Constitution in a new way, you see, because he's, he's, he's tapping into the, po the popular sovereignty, which is the legitimate origin of the Constitution. Uh, and he says at one point in, in his, one of his journal entries, why may, not the present, why may not the present age write through me its political autobiography? That is an extraordinary claim, isn't it? And um, uh, and uh, he's and, and so so what he's saying is that the, look, the Constitution must become elastic under the guide of the uh, the president. The the president can then focus public opinion in his person on this bureaucracy and thus keep it in line. That's his theory of how of how this new this new kind of constitutionalism would work. Uh, he says, uh, in terms of America, the Constitution is like a snug garment uh, stretched to cover the, so great a giant as our nation has become. It, if it didn't stretch, it would tear. Well, he's going to be the one who is the stretcher of the Constitution, and the legitimacy of that is going to come from his tapping into public opinion, which he claims to embody. Um, and this is the notion of, of uh, leadership. Leadership, leadership is not statesmanship. Leadership, it means that the president uh, is, the, is on the cutting edge of public opinion. He's shaping it, he's molding it, he's leading the people uh, towards these, these, new, these new institutions, including a professional bureaucracy. And uh, he says he's uh, only a strong executive vouchsafed the freedom of prerogative which must include the power of supplementing as well as shaping the law. Supplementing as well as shaping the law. So again, that's, a, that's, not what, um, that's not what George Washington or even Abraham Lincoln would say about the Constitution. That's a new form of government. And uh, what he also says is that the president should understand his own day, meaning his own period of history, the needs of the country, and he needs the personality and the initiative to enforce his views, both upon the people and upon Congress. Uh, because he has the ear of the whole nation, it is undoubtedly its chosen spokesman and representative. The president may place the House of Representatives at a great disadvantage if he chooses to appeal to the nation. And that's, that's what's going on there. So uh, you see that's how different that is. Well, thank you. That's a great overview um, of, of Woodrow Wilson and, and just where he was coming from and, um, and, and his view of a uh, very different view of, uh, it seems, from, from what the founders intended with our Constitution and we the people versus... Uh, President Wilson's view. And I'm going to turn it over to, to Jewel. Hello, <clears throat> Hello Professor. Uh, thank you. Could you just repeat that last uh, passage there where you said that the executive could place the House at a disadvantage by appealing? Um, could you just... Uh, yeah, maybe... I'll, I'll, I'll read you the whole thing. I'll read you the whole thing. Um, the, the, he says that uh, the people, uh, he, the, the president should understand his own day, right, meaning his own time in American history, and the needs of the country, 
and has the personality and the initiative to enforce his views upon the, both upon the people and upon Congress. But, and because he has the ear of the whole nation and is undoubtedly its chosen spokesman and representative, the president may place the House of Representatives at a great disadvantage if he chooses to appeal to the nation. Because he's he's one voice, right? Whereas the House of Representatives, of course, is many voices. And so he can concentrate in his person the, the spirit of the times and the spirit of the American people as he has understood those things. Isn't that extraordinary? Yes, it seems like... Uh almost a complete dichotomy to a Washingtonian approach to the executive branch. It is. We would have thought. Yeah. And it's also a complete, uh, uh, even Abraham Lincoln, right, who was sometimes considered to be the big, strong president who inaugurates the modern presidency. Lincoln is very concerned about the Constitution all the time. Uh, the, the, the issue of, um, of uh, uh, freeing the slaves. He wouldn't do it until uh, a certain time, and he only did it when it, he, he, where the Constitution could actually be enforced in the states where it could be enforced. The, he couldn't do it in the, in the South, and he recognized these things. He did suspend the writ of habeas corpus. A president always had the, the, the authority to, to, uh, to suspend the Constitution if there was a national emergency of some sort. But this isn't a national emergency he's talking about. He's talking about, uh, Wilson is talking about routine way of governing the country. Very different. Yes. Now, you talked, you had referenced the administrative state, which is somewhat ushered in with Wilson and his understanding of government. Now, we have talked about the administrative state on this show, and it is certainly an important topic to talk about. It seems as if in studying American history, there is such a cataclysmic shift when we look at post um, the modern area of er, era of government and the way it looks, and prior to the government looks. When I ask questions though of times when I ask questions about the nature of the administrative state and the uh, agencies that have been set up. I'm pointed to things like the post office prior to Woodrow Wilson and these other administrative state agencies as a uh, as uh, telling me that there there wasn't that much of a change. It was just an expansion of something that was already there. Uh, could you answer that? And what what are your thoughts? Well, let's put it this way. In uh, one one example would be the State Department. When Thomas Jefferson was George Washington's Secretary of State in the 1790s, he had a staff consisting of about six people. <laughs> See, that's not, that's not, and, and they weren't professional administrators. Um, they were, they were typically, they were political appointees uh, uh, by the Washington administration. So, uh, the administrative state is a professional bureaucracy. It isn't. It isn't. Uh, it isn't staffed by political appointees. Uh, many. They. These are tenured civil servants who have their jobs for life as long as they don't uh, violate the law in some heinous way. Uh, the other thing about the administrative state, which is important to know, and Thomas Jefferson would certainly have been alarmed at this, in 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 the modern administrative state. If you run afoul of, 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 uh, of the law, of the administrative law, first of all, the administrative law is designed by the, by the administrative state. It's filling in a con very broad congressional law, but the details are all done uh, by, the administ by administrators, by professional administrators. So they are lawgivers. You then go, if you violate it, that you then go to an administrative court which is also part of the administrative state. And if you are found guilty in the administrative court, the administration also enforces that law, punishes you. So in other words, all three branches, uh, all three uh, functions of government, which are separated in the constitution, executive, legislative, judicial, are melded together in the, in the, in the administrative state. 
Uh, now, Thomas Jefferson would have been alarmed at that because he says that to combine those three powers is the definition of tyranny. So what you get now, instead of having simply a democratic republic where all the officials in the government, federal government, are either elected or appointed by elected officials, such as the Supreme Court, instead of that, you have uh, a, 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 a government, a, a piece of the government that is quasi-independent of the, the other branches of government. It's a little bit like a... Um, it's a non-democratic, or if you want to say oligarchic or aristocratic uh, element that has been introduced into the former constitutional government of the United States. Does that answer your question? It seems like, definitely. Um, it definitely does. It is, it is a, in college classes, it was kind of, uh, professors would often poo-poo the the concept of the administrative state, um, despite how how large it is, and it, it was kind of hard to to get over that. As we would say, well, look at this massive, look at this huge thing that can do that has this incredible power, and and uh, it was often. I'm sure many people who are listening to the podcast have had a similar experience as well when they pointed out. I don't. From what you just said about our constitutional system, how can how could it doesn't seem like the constitutional system cannot operate with a administrative state with people who are in those positions, not due to elections and yet exert power over the American people. And we don't know who they are. We don't know their names. We don't know where these, who decided these, who decided these, these laws, because they're not laws, as you said, but who, who made up these rules that are, that are operating like laws. Well, um, they, they they make up their own rules, right? Uh, within within a very broad general framework, typically, uh, and Kathy knows this too. Uh, uh, in Washington, the, the the legislature will pass a very broadly uh, constructed or broadly worded law, and then it leaves it up to the and the president signs it, and then it leads it leaves it up to the administrators to to flesh it out. Uh, well, the devil is in the details. Now, when you say, how could this be under the Constitution? The answer is, of course, Woodrow Wilson's stretchable Constitution. If you say the Constitution is stretchable or a living Constitution, then, of course, it can grow an administrative state all by itself because it's stretchable. <laughs> so would there need to be a new... Sorry to turn my video off because I'm having some internet issues, but I'm here uh, listening to your answers uh, carefully. So, would there need to be a new a clarification of a law or some, or, or would it need to be a Supreme Court ruling, or how would we get back to our original understanding of the constitute of of this part of the Constitution? Yeah, it would have to be either a constitutional amendment or a a, a, a major Supreme Court decision. Um, and the Supreme Court has not shown any. You see, the thing is, this business of the stretchable constitution, it's no longer just a matter of the presidency, the way it was in Wilson's time. The, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, less now at the, in the current uh, constellation of justices, but for many decades, the Supreme Court bought into this eventually, um, starting in the 1930s. Um, under the pressure from the uh, Roosevelt administration and the court packing plan that he proposed in the late 1930s, uh, they uh, sort of backed off on, on knocking down New Deal legislation, and they started accepting uh, these uh, this, these notions, and they started doing it themselves, right? The, the, the notion of the living constitution was, I believe, Justice Brennan, William Brennan was the one who coined that phrase. I, I may be wrong about that, but uh, it was one of the judges that uh, that uh, uh, coined that phrase. Are there any more particular instances that we want to point to that Woodrow Wilson, in his basic uh, inception of this administrative state, where he lended that e executive and legislative power to new a new body? Are there some instances we'd point to during? Woodrow Wilson's presidency that we would say, wow, this is this is a new exertion of power that wasn't that we haven't seen before. 
he he um, uh, not so much um, um, unless you want to get into his foreign policy, which of course was the League of Nations, that kind of thing. That would that was certainly a a, a stretch in terms of uh, uh, the possible compromise of American sovereignty by joining a permanent uh, organization that could vote down uh, potentially vote down a, an act of an American an American uh, president, but. Um, um, in terms of he he was more the theoretician or the uh, the the developer of the the ideas of the of of, of this uh, stretchable or elastic constitution. It was really uh, because he was blocked by a lot of stuff by the U.S. Senate, but the uh, the one who really got it going was uh, was FDR. Wow. Now, what would we? Do you think most of our politicians it was, seems like i would think most of our politicians on on all sides somewhat take what we're talking about for granted as part of the normal way government operates was there ever was there at some point in was there at some point legitimate pushback to this new understanding or addressing this different understanding of the government sure um um, uh, during uh, during the late 1940s, uh, uh, Robert Taft uh, from Ohio was uh, a pretty conservative guy in terms of conserving the Constitution. Uh, the Barry Goldwater campaign in 1964 was uh, talking about this. And uh, to some extent, uh, Reagan uh, talked about it a bit. Um, so there have been there have been people who have pushed back against it. Uh, most of them not getting to the point of, of being presidents of the United States, however, and none of them have really been too effective in in actually rolling it back. Taft was never he never came close to being elected. He wasn't even nominated, and uh, Goldwater, of course, lost in a landslide to Lyndon Johnson uh, because a lot of those New Deal programs were very very popular with uh, with the, with the people, and by then they had become accustomed to uh, these, uh, these massive uh, uh, programs that were administered by uh, professional bureaucrats. Would we, would the best label for Woodrow Wilson's political ideology be just progressivism or yes. is there a better label? Yeah, I, I think that's the best one. Um, and if you want me to talk a little bit about what that means, I can do that. Um, uh, Progressivism, you have to ask yourself the question. This Really, the question is, where does he get these ideas from? These are institutions, right? The administrative state, leadership in the presidency, the elastic constitution. It all has to do with the, 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 administ the uh, institutions of the country. <clears throat> but what justifies that? You know, you have to ask what what justifies that? Now, we know what justifies the U.S. Constitution because they tell us that in the prior document, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the governments are intended to secure our natural rights, uh, our unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in accordance with the laws of nature and of nature's God. So uh, the philosophic question is where do where do rights come from? Where do you, what's the what's the derivation of right? And what the founders say is that. Uh, God and the nature that God made is the source of right. Um, the Bible would tell you something about that, but also just reasoning about the nature of human beings. What's good for a human being? What does a human being need to flourish fully as a human being? Well, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, <laughs> the basics, right? So, so those are th that's the source of right. You could also there. There were other people who uh, proposed other sources of right. Uh, there's utilitarianism. Um, there is Immanuel Kant, who talks about what he calls the categorical imperative. But here's the dilemma: in in the 18th century, the Enlightenment occurred, and the enlighten the Enlightenment was kind of a mixed bag. It wanted republicanism, typically in 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 the form of a regime. But it was very, very worried about deri deriving right from nature, because they understood nature to be just matter in motion, you know, atoms circulating around. Well, how do you derive right 
from a na if you conceive nature that way. You can derive right from a nature that has a purpose, right? If human beings form purposes according to their uh, according to according to their nature, and uh, uh, that's where right comes from. But uh, if you deny that then nature can no longer be the source of right. And of course, many of the enlighteners were also atheists, so they couldn't derive their right from God. So what do you do? Well, the, the answer to that at the turn of the 19th century, circa 1800 in those years, was, uh, was formulated by a, a German philosopher, one of the greatest uh, philosophers, uh, G.W.F. Hegel, very formidable philosopher who said this, he said, I'm not going to derive right from nature and from God as understood by as the God of the Bible. I'm going, I say that the, the way right comes about is that all of being, everything that exists is unfolding. It's, it's, it's evolving. It's evolving to the, it's all of, all of history human history, the whole history of, of everything, the history of the cosmos is all evolving towards a, the end of history, the purpose of history, which is the complete control of, of nature and of our surroundings by the human mind. Now, what, what, he, ta what he says is that all, everything, everything consists of what he calls not the Holy Spirit, but the absolute spirit. The absolute spirit is unfolding in this way. And one of the, uh, so, so in other words, history is the, history is the source of right, not nature, not God, but the absolute spirit unfolding itself over time. That's, that's what, that's where right comes from. And in, 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 in saying this, he says that the, the rational means of controlling nature will be in part, at least politically, uh, an administrative state a scientific bureaucracy, science being the form of rationality that is the most effective in ruling nature. Okay? And that's an entirely different idea. What happens is with the progressives is that these, these ideas really don't have much play in America until um, starting in the, maybe in the 1870s, at, uh, in the decade after the Civil War. Um, uh, German uh, ideas like that didn't come in until until that time. A man like Wilson and also John Dewey, who was the other major progressive of that first generation, they learned this at the Johns Hopkins University, which was the first German style research university in the country. And um, and uh, so Wilson, when he when he writes that 1886 essay, he is he has been he has been thoroughly uh, educated by his mentors who had gotten their PhDs in Germany, who came over wow. back to the United States. You see, and they they were the ones who uh, educated that that first generation of American progressives. Now the, that really the, gives us a that gives us such a inter giving it. I feel like every question i just asked you you got down to the to the fundamental point that helps us understand these really huge questions but you got down to where the ideas start so we can put them in order i really it's, appreciate that it's yeah. a revolution in thought not just a revolution in governing institutions it's a revolution in philosophy and a revolution in theology too because the holy spirit is separate right god creates everything uh he but he's separate from his creation the absolute spirit is permeates all creation it, it is all creation and so it's and it's all unfolding in this in this manner uh and, and over time and that's where legitimacy comes from very very different uh and very radically different from what anything that the american founders uh, were thinking about and explains much of what we see Thank, mm -hmm. thank you for your uh, answers, and I know Kenyon's got some great questions lined up for you. Great. Yes, thank you, Professor Morrissey, for being on today. Oh, um, thank you. I had a question about, you were talking about how the Enlightenment, Enlightenment philosophers and scientists were very atheistic in their worldview and how that shaped 
today's politics and everything else. Um, why do you think that it tur- the philosophy turns so atheistic and materialistic at the end of the in like the Renaissance era? Uh, yeah, well, one of the problems there was a major problem in uh, Christendom in European Christendom in the 17th and 18th centuries. And that was that uh, once, uh, the, of course, the Roman Empire was long gone and the Holy Roman Empire, which was, a, 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 the, of course, a Catholic organization, uh, was starting to weaken a bit. Uh, Prussia and other places started breaking off and forming nation states, right? Nation states uh, beyond these empires. England did that very early on. And um, and so they um, it's, 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 and the 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 person who started that who theorized that move was actually in the Renaissance and that was Niccolo Machiavelli who was a Florentine diplomat who wrote a very famous book called The Prince and also another book called uh, Discourses on uh, it, it's called the Discourses it's about republicanism. And uh, Machiavelli thought that Christianity, his, his, he, he was against Christianity. He was an atheist. And he thought that Christianity was too weak to govern properly. Christianity, in his view, was, um, was, uh, was too otherworldly. It distracted you with the kingdom of God when you should be paying attention to, uh, to the kingdom of this world. And uh, and so statesmen, princes were being distracted by all this this uh, this uh, this kingdom of God sort of thing when they were, should be paying attention to what the other states in the region were doing and, uh, and and challenging them. So so the core of that modern movement was an att- and and what Machiavelli says is you know you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, orient yourself toward God you should think about to not depending on God's providence or fortune. He says you should take control of fortune. You should conquer fortune. Um, now, his, his, uh, his philosophic disciple, Francis Bacon in England, uh, said formulated this in terms of science. He says that science should be the conquest of nature for the relief of man's estate, meaning man's condition, if man's condition is in a hostile environment, he must take control by the means of the scientific experimental method, take control of nature and start shaping it so that it is so that it is uh, so, so he can have a, a, an environment where he can elongate his life and he can uh, and enjoy the things that he wants to enjoy. Now, um, so the Enlightenment picks up on those elements of the Renaissance. And you notice one of the first uh, regimes that, um, that, uh, that took the, 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 the Catholic church and made it into a national church was what? Tudor England, Francis Bacon's England, uh, Hen- the, the, uh, Henry, Henry, Henry VIII, uh, his daughter, Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, these people took the the Catholic Church and made it into what the Anglican Church, a national church. Um, uh, so it, it became a, 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 an element of the of the modern state now. And so all of this all of this is gestating, and the Enlightenment really makes it very clear. That's where that comes from. The Enlightenment, uh, the Enlightenment atheism, and Enlightenment uh, love of modern science. For the for for the conquest of nature comes from Machiavelli and Bacon. Thank you for that very comprehensive question. That really answered it very well. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is why exactly did the progressive movement like when why did it prove so um like why did so many people in the government and in the citizen private citizen sector why did so many people enough people support it that it grew into the thought ideology thing that shapes us our nation so much today two things first of all they they were on to something in saying that there were 
uh, uh, that America had, the civil society of America had become bigger and more complicated, right? You do have corporations that are uh, sometimes bribing the uh, elected officials, right? You do have corruption. You do have, uh, uh, in, in terms of in, in industrial capitalism, you have very severe labor management strife around the turn of that century, around 1900. That was one of the most violent, probably the most violent period of labor strife in American history during that period. So people were worried about these things. They were looking for some sort of answer. So they had a ready audience in that sense. But the other thing they had, which was crucial, is that if you think about the administrative state and you think about the modern university, especially modern research universities, such as Johns Hopkins, but soon uh, many of the state universities and eventually almost all of them. If you think about that, there's a nexus between an education and a professional bureaucracy. If you're going to have a professional bureaucracy, that means you're going to have huge numbers of jobs opening up not only on the federal level, but also on the state, county, and even local level. People who need degrees, college degrees in administration and in other areas of, of, of expertise. And so if the if and that means that there's a whole professional class, not just the, you know, your your country lawyers and your country doctors that you had in the 18th and 19th centuries, but a professional class of people who see this as a tremendous job opportunity. Furthermore, they're among the most articulate and soon to be well-educated people in the country. So they're going to be able to shape public opinion. They're going to be articulating public opinion. They're going to be able to uh, uh, do uh, effective camp political campaigns to get people who agree with them elected. And that's how it happens. It's uh, So it's a combination of uh, the felt need of the people for answers to uh, so civil social tensions in, the, in that time. Uh, don't forget, uh, a populist like William Jennings Bryan uh, did pretty well for himself, never got elected for president, but he ran against the banks, right? Uh, uh, he's not a progressive, but he's, he's, he, that sort of ferment is there. Plus you have uh, uh, these great job opportunities opening up for the most uh, articulate and many of the smartest people in the country. Thank you, that really explains it well. And, um... Another question I had was, um, how did um, it, you mentioned the League of Nations and how Woodrow Wilson helped set that up? Can you please explain like how that, how he set that up and the effects that we still feel today from that organization? Yeah, he. Uh, it's now, of course, the United Nations. It's a different organization. The League didn't do too well for itself because World War II broke out. Here's what happened. And this goes back to the basic uh, philosophic principles again. I mentioned Immanuel Kant, the uh, German philosopher who predated Hegel. Uh, I just mentioned him just in passing. One of the things he wrote was a, uh, a, a short essay called Perpetual Peace, he was responding to the problem of these wars in Europe, these chronic wars in Europe, the, uh, many of them religiously based wars and therefore uncompromising. We see this right today within, in the Middle East. How do, you, how do you get a compromise when, when the two sides are, are convinced that, the, uh, that the, their religion tells them to fight? That's uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to stop that. So what, what, will, uh, what Kant says is this. He says, someday, someday Europe will have a cataclysmic war, the worst war it has ever had. All the nations will fall back in exhaustion and they will realize that they need something, some international organization to prevent wars in the future. And what he calls it is a League of Nations. That's where that term comes from. It comes from this essay from Kant back in the 1790s. So, 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 he, so he says, so what Wilson is looking at, he's looking at world, what they called the Great War in those days, World War I now, but it was called the Great War in those days. He's thinking, this is it. This is the war 
that that uh, Emmanuel Kant foresaw. And that means that I have the opportunity as the president of the United States, getting into the war very late, tipping the scales in favor of the Demo democratic republics. I have the opportunity here to, to, to catalyze a League of Nations for the first time. That's how it happens. And now, of course, as you know, the uh, US Senate didn't go along with America joining the League of Nations, but it was established in Europe and uh, it, uh, it didn't work out uh, as we all know, because uh, a man named Adolf Hitler came along to uh, overthrow the whole thing. But that's, that's the origin of it. Okay, thank you so much for that. And now I will pass to Kathy for some audience questions because I know we probably have quite a few. Well, thank you, Kenyon. Those are great questions. And, and thank you, Jewel, as well. Um, and we do have quite a few audience questions. But before we get to the audience questions, I'm going to give shout outs to a few teachers and classrooms that are watching today. We have James Evans from CGCC and Fred Persley from the Mansfield Classical Academy. So welcome James and Fred, and we welcome your students, and we're so glad that you're watching today. We also wanna thank our listeners on Las Vegas's KKVV 1060 AM on the radio dial. KKVV in Las Vegas airs Constituting America's Constitutional Chats podcast on Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific. So thank you to everyone in Las Vegas who's listening. So Professor Morrissey, we have some really great uh, audience questions lined up. I'm going to start with Julianne Smith. And Julianne asks, if you could undo one thing of Woodrow Wilson as president of the United States, what would it be? Um, well, hmm. I don't know. It's I, I would I don't know if there's one thing. I think the what I would like to undo is the notion that is b w w the, the root of his of his thought. You know, which is the, the this notion of uh, let's call it historicism. The notion that there's this 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 march of history that is carrying us on. That uh, presidents are entitled to uh, uh, embody the the thought and uh, and and speech of the of of the country. I think that would be that would you have to go to the root of these things. If you if you hack away at the branches, they'll grow back or they'll grow out in some other form. So I would I would go for the root. Well, I think that's what you're so what you're so enlightening to us on is going to the root. And we really appreciate that. And then uh, Bill Gorski asked a question, which you've already answered a little bit, but I didn't know if you wanted an opportunity to go a little deeper on it. Uh, Bill asks, who influenced President Wilson in developing his theory of the administrative state? And I know you talked a little bit about his time at Johns Hopkins and the uh, German uh, philosophers, but is there more that you'd want to say on that? Yeah, well, um, Johns Hopkins, uh, there were uh, professors there who had studied in Germany. Uh, George, I believe he was George Sylvester Morris, was one of the major influences of both uh, John Dewey and Woodrow Wilson. In fact, uh, when Dewey got his first academic appointment at the, Mich I believe it was at Michigan State, um, either Michigan State or University of Michigan, uh, Morris was the one who got him that appointment. So in other words, there was a, there was an a, a conscious attempt to um, uh, educate or, if you want, indoctrinate these young graduate students and then send them out into the world to um, to 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 spread these these ideas of progressivism through ac academia first. It's always it's typically academia first, if you notice, with these um, with these uh, political revolutions. It's, it starts in the universities very often, and then it percolates out because if the education if the educated classes start talking in a certain way, then others will pick up on it. Well, thank you for that. And uh, then Hope Mucklow asks, was John Dewey in collaboration with Horace Mann in abandoning traditional thought and Christian values in public school to the modern progressive philosophy? And then Hope also asks, who funded the progressive movement? Well, the first one, Horace Mann is much earlier. Um, so, um, uh, Dewey, Dewey's, Dewey is around at the same time Wilson is, although he lived a good deal longer. 
Um, and he he um, he he wrote numerous books on educational theory and on democracy, uh, both and linking the two together. But it's this 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 new progressive conception of democracy. So uh, in terms of so well, I wouldn't say Horace Mann so much as uh, as, uh, uh, as as a genuine progressive. Horace Mann really doesn't think in terms of of um, his, history as the as the source of right. It's a different it's a different story with him. Um, now, as far as who funded them is concerned, um, uh, I couldn't give you names specifically. I've never, uh, but the what happened was that the political parties, of course, would do their own fundraising. The Democratic Party was taken over by its progressive wing during this time, and they uh, they they raised money through their usual sources of uh, of funding. Um, I don't. You, know, you, you I would. I wouldn't be able to tell you who specifically was funding this, though. Uh, you know, in, in names of financiers or something like that. I that I don't know. I'm a political scientist, not a historian. <laughs> well, you know a lot more about history than I do. That's for sure. So, um, Lewis White uh, mentions the Seventeenth Amendment. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Seventeenth Amendment, and uh, was it, was Woodrow Wilson active in in the effort to to pass the Seventeenth Amendment, and and what kind of effect that you think the Seventeenth Amendment had on on? Okay, our now state the Seventeenth Amendment again. Well, the Seventeenth Amendment would repeal the uh, state legislature's ability to nominate uh, or put in place senators and call instead for the direct election oh, okay, right. senators um, right. from the very- so those, those numbers run together in my mind I so know, much. I know. Uh, I think so, but the direct election of senators, that, yes. First of all, the progressive movement was started, uh, got got its first political traction within the states. So this, the, the, and the idea of having direct, more direct democracy, not only the direct uh, election of senators, but in many states, you start getting initiative and referendum uh, and other forms of direct democracy. The idea being that these opinion leaders would be able to shape public opinion and then get uh, get people to vote for the, the kind of uh, policies in the case of initiative and referendum or candidates in the case of direct uh, election of senators, um, to, who people people would be uh, uh, on board with the progressive project. So that's how it works. It's uh, it starts that that whole movement got traction in the states, uh, states like Wisconsin, for example, and other states that were uh, uh, were really uh, uh, the 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 uh, forerunners of the pr progressive movement on the national level. Okay. Um, and then Julianne uh, Smith has another question. What would you say was Wilson's legacy, both positive and negative, as president of the United States? Well, uh, I think I've covered the negative. Um, positive, well, he, um, I'd have to go get back to you on that one. I'm not a big fan of Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> uh, he was a forceful president. Uh, he, uh, you could say that he has a uh, a, a major impact. He, he, the, the whole notion of the the president as an opinion leader, which we see today when they go on television, right, and they try to uh, uh, lead opinion in their direction, that kind of thing. Um, uh, he was he was a very impactful type of president. Uh, whether his impact was good, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, you could say that he. I guess you could say that uh, in. In 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 getting America into World War One, he abbreviated that war. Uh, um, um, in that sense, maybe that would be an achievement of his. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Lewis White wants to find a little bit more about um, in the Constitution. Does it actually say that the president can suspend the Constitution, or uh, did we hear that? correctly earlier or um what where where would that authority come from i think you had mentioned in an emergency maybe the president yeah, it comes to, it comes from the natural right to defend yourself so for example uh, we've had five declared wars in american history 
but we fought a couple hundred wars. Now, why is that so? It's because the, the, the uh, president of the United States is entitled, if somebody uh, attacks the, the United States, the president is, is entitled to, uh, to, as commander in chief, to call up the, the, the army to defend the country. Uh, whether or not there's a, a declaration of war. If it, what if Congress isn't in town? What if it's too, you know, what, you have to, what if you have to act immediately? Uh, there are times when that happens. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, 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 purchased another, another example of that, which is not war, is uh, when uh, Thomas Jefferson purchased Louisiana from Napoleon. If you if you recall what he said that that's not that's not specifically mentioned in the Constitution, but what Jefferson says is, look, because the Mississippi River is what it is, the largest river network, not just the Mississippi itself, but the Ohio River, all the rivers that lead into it, because that is the major the the the, the one con we have the one continent in the world where a major river system overlays some of the richest and biggest farmland in the world. And it all flows out into the uh, Gulf of Mexico through New Orleans. Any country that controls New Orleans, he says, is the enemy of the United States because it can block, it can bottle up all our, all our commerce from the middle of the country. So what he does when he gets the opportunity to purchase Louisiana and therefore New Orleans from Napoleon, he jumps on it. He doesn't wait for uh, authorization from Congress. He eventually gets it, but uh, he, he jumps on it right away. And um, um, that's the kind of thing, a uh, kind of uh, natural necessity. You've always, uh, another example of that would be just in your personal life. Normally, if someone has committed a crime against you or you call the cops, right? You go through the legal system. But what if you're being assaulted? You have the right to defend yourself and, in fact, to take out a gun and shoot a person who's threatening your life. That's not that's beyond the law, typically, right? But it's uh, it's 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 a it's an it's an executive action that you've taken. It's your natural right uh, to to defend yourself, whatever the law may say. Well, thank you, and. Uh, one other question that we had was uh, the recent Supreme Court decisions. There have been several recent Supreme Court decisions on the administrative state that have dialed it back just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see a trend there that the Supreme Court is starting to reverse uh, some of Wilson's administrative state, uh, uh, in, I guess, initiatives that, that he began? I do. Um, this this court is um, is uh, is is much more of a, an originalist, if you will, uh, court than previous courts have been. Um, they are uh, the majority, really, for the first time for a long time. The majority of uh, the Supreme Court justices are uh, what they used to call strict constructionists, and uh, or sometimes they call them originalists. Various words for them, but they they want to. Uh, interpret the Constitution in the terms in which it was originally framed, and according to the intentions as we understand them of the people who uh, framed it and the people who framed the various amendments. Um, so that means that, for example, you'd still have um, direct, uh, direct uh, uh, election of senators because that was an amendment. The, uh, they couldn't reverse that, but they can reverse uh, uh, they might be able to reverse some of the the, the agencies uh, that they have been invented that have no apparent constitutional uh, constitutional uh, foundation. Well, thank you. And then uh, we've got a couple of comments here. Uh, Bill Gorski says, "Excellent presentation. Keep up the great work." And thank you. It, it really has been an excellent presentation. And then Robert uh, Creer has an interesting analogy, I think, to the administrative state. Uh, Robert says, the administrative state's birth has grown to become in human form what the warnings are about the birth of AI could uncontrollably self-grow to become, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting way to look at it. Uh, 
Would you have any comments on on Roberts? Well, both, both of those both of those things. Uh, the administrative state is an earlier example, of course, but AI is another way in which human beings attempt to master fortune or conquer nature, right? Um, and um, sometimes the the problem is that in both cases they can get out of human control. <laughs> so. Well, that's a great way to, to close out our program, I think, for today. So, Professor Morsi, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you to our audience. And thank you, Kenyon and Jewel and Jorn. Uh, we just had a great discussion today. We invite everybody to come back next week. We're going to be talking about Herbert Hoover and the Constitution. So we will see you all next week. Any closing words for us, Professor Morsi? No, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm glad I could contribute. Well, and I think we dropped, hopefully we dropped a link in to your, uh, yes, we did. Uh, the link to Professor Morrissey's website is www.williammorrisseyreviews.com. So we encourage everyone to go check that out. W Willmorrissey.com. Will Morrissey. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> www.willmorrisseyreviews.com. We typed it correctly in the Q&A. I just didn't read it correctly. Okay, good. And then you spelled Morrissey right too, didn't you? M O R R I S E Y. <laughs> Two R's, one S. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Very good. Okay, bye.